Okay. Hello, welcome to Pint of Science 2022. <laughs> Yay. Um, so we're your hosts for tonight. This is Anna and, <laughs> and I'm Sam. Um, we're both uh, PhD candidates in the geography department and Anna works with like perceptions of African animals or something like that. I probably <laughs> bodged it up. <laughs> and I work with forests and so you know both of us kind of do like the nature stuff but not much of the urban stuff so we've got lots of, to learn tonight and um, I'm going to tell you a bit about Pint of Science not much but who's been to Pint of Science before in the room yeah okay well welcome back to Pint of Science and for all the rest of you hope you become addicted as well um, so it's been running for 10 years now hence um, 10th edition on here and it started off with two academics who just had this vision to kind of get scientists out of academia into the pubs you know talking to real people in normal language <laughs> and um, <laughs> so we'll see if it's worked tonight no I'm joking <laughs> um, yeah so uh, what am I saying yeah they're going to share their research with you tonight. So I've just got a few housekeeping things. Um, fire exit is here and basically down one flight of stairs the way you came in. Um, the toilet's down in the basement, but if there's a fire, don't go to the toilet. Um, and what else? Uh, so we'll have... Hold on, I need to click. Oh, Anna's going to click for me. Okay, so here's the um, lineup. So um, we'll have a chance to answer some questions after each talk, but also at the end as well. So we'll just see how time is going. Um, and good news is we actually have a prize, a prize, not a surprise, a <laughs> prize, um, which is a pint of science pint glass. And it's going to be for the best question, OK, which is going to be judged by our panel over there. But I don't want to. I don't want to intimidate you because tonight is not about having an exam. You know, don't get nervous. Every question is welcome. Okay, so like, even if you think it's completely stupid, just ask it because otherwise we're all going to be like really awkwardly bored if nobody asks anything. Um, so yeah, over to Anna. I think I haven't forgotten anything important. Uh, the schedule. Oh, the schedule. <laughs> I did. I'm, I'm really um, consistently inconsistent. Um, yeah, so we're going to have our first speaker, um, Rob Francis, talking about plastic grass. Then we're going to have an interval. So I don't know if any of you um, pre-ordered pizzas or anything, because we had a bit of a cut-off. So those will come up during the interval, and obviously you can go down and get a pint and whatever. And then we're going to have our second um, talk about canines, and then, as I said, we'll just have general questions and then close in where we tell you to go home, but you don't have to. No, <laughs> we want you to talk to us and hang around and whatever. And have a great night. And here's Anna being sensible. <laughs> yeah, I'm the boring one tonight. Um, so I'm giving a bit of an overview to what we mean by urban nature, but I thought I'd start us off with a few jokes. Not that I'm the most natural comedian, <laughs> so bear with me for a second. So... Uh, I used to make loads of money clearing leaves from lawns. I was raking it in. <laughs> and uh, someone stole the grass from my garden once. I was feeling very forlorn. Uh, on our second subject, <laughs> a local dog gave birth at the side of the road. She got fined for littering. <laughs> And there's another local dog, and he's always barking at everyone. He's a crossbreed. <laughs> okay, that's enough of that. So <laughs> that, that's the fun bit over. Any, <laughs> any takers on what urban nature means to you or any examples of urban nature? Just shout them out. Be Jones. Yeah, pigeons is a good one. <laughs> Any other urban animals? Rats. Foxes. <laughs> yeah, rats, foxes. Peacocks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, some cities, yeah. 
Um, so if you, if you Google definition of urban nature, it comes up with areas in urban environments that are home to plants and non-human animals, which seems like a, a very logical definition. And you urban dwellers and city goers in the room, I'm sure many of you will be familiar tonight with our animal friends in London, from our foxiest neighbours to unperturbed pigeon pedestrians. <laughs> Bit of a mouthful. And you might have even enjoyed the city's many parks with a cold drink on a sunny afternoon like today, or even spotted a rodent friend scuttling across the station on your tube journey here. But we can take our understanding of urban nature a little bit further by calling in to help this definition from National, National Geographic, which says, most of the time when people think about nature, they think of places untouched by humans, far away from cities. So we know that nature is not just beautiful, pristine environments and majestic animals. And we know that there is nature in our cities and that it goes beyond your local park or the squirrels digging up the bulbs you planted in your garden this spring. And that's not a personal vendetta or anything. I love all animals. <laughs> uh, but the reality is that nature in its urban configuration is a lot more complicated, complex, um, mysterious and wondrous than the fenced off parks and creatures that make them their homes. So these talks tonight are a window into this way of looking at the world, whilst challenging perceptions of nature, what it is and what impact this has on both the environment and society. So now I'm going to pass over to Sam to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> okay, first up tonight, we have Dr. Rob Francis, who's the reader of ecology in our department. Um, and his research um, is quite a lot, like, of different things, <laughs> which is why I'm reading some of it from here. So it goes from, like, freshwater habitats to sprawling cities, human to non-human, eco-hydrology to warfare ecology, Rob certainly knows his stuff. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> sorry. sorry, I'm going to tell a really bad joke and I'm spoiling it because I'm laughing at it before I've even <laughs> told. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you know, um, Rob, you know, he's looking at urban nature. So if there's something strange in your neighbourhood, <laughs> who are you going to call? Rob Francis! <laughs> okay, so tonight he's going to be talking about um, artificial lawns. And I'm speaking to some people before this. Some people in the room may or may not have artificial lawns. Or their families. Oh, no, but we all agree. We want to hear more. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Can you hear me all right? I'm not sure I can live up to that, uh, to that introduction, to be honest, but we'll carry on. So, um, yeah, so I'm Rob Francis. I'm a, an urban ecologist at King's. Um, this talk is about plastic grass. Just put your hand up if you do actually have plastic. And no <laughs> judgment involved, I mind at all. Have you seen it? When you've been walking around, yeah. it is everywhere, as the title of this talk says, it is everywhere. Um, there are various reasons for that. I'm going to talk a bit about why people are installing it, because it seems very odd and counterintuitive to replace a natural ecosystem with something which is completely artificial, as well as some of the environmental impacts that we suspect, or in some cases have demonstrated from you know, replacing a living lawn with, with plastic grass. What interests me from a philosophical point of view is not just the fact that it's replacing, replacing the, uh, <coughs> the lawn with grass, but there's also a broader trend to try to um, create artificial plants that look very realistic. So this is the um, IKEA artificial plant section in the Milton Keynes IKEA, which is the closest one to me. They're all very realistic. There's been a real advance in recent years in trying to find uh, ways to kind of make nature, artificial nature, look increasingly um, <coughs> realistic. And why is that? You know, what's the kind of logic behind that? So I'm going to address some of these sorts of points as we go forward. Before I um, <clears throat> talk about the plastic grass, I just want to acknowledge that there is a whole kind of cultural legacy behind the idea of the lawn as an entity. So this is a, you know, a nice kind of classic example of a lawn here, the domestic lawn. Even for hundreds of years, this is a landscaping guide from 1733 noting that the ideal English lawn it lies about the manor without trees and stuff, not pent up with trees around it. It's this real kind of um, <clears throat> status symbol, if you like, that people would aspire to. So when people got their own personal private green space, 
they started to have the ambition to have a kind of nice manicured lawn. It's an idealized ecosystem that is really part of the, sort of the, the kind of English idyll, um, if you like. And it's, it's linked to colonialism and all sorts of things. So that we, as we colonize other countries, we've exported this idea of having a law, it's something which is expected uh, you know, in your domestic space. And the lawn is sort of used as a form of judgment. So if you have a good lawn, there's a lot of moral worth associated with having a good lawn. It means that you're a good, a good neighbor. You're in control. You don't like things that are untidy. Um, you, know, you, you take care of, the, of your, your space, your personal space, if you like. And, and it's a billion dollar global industry. So this is just the, the latest figure I could find from the, um, the National Guardian Association in the US. $30 billion spent on lawn care in the last year. So if you think around the world, there is this huge amount of money that people spend, huge amount of time and effort trying to maintain a lawn. Um, for various reasons, of course. So, <clears throat> plastic grass, uh, and I've got some examples here, if no one's ever actually seen it, which I can put on the tables. Uh, pass that around. Right from ready crap versions, which look just like, you know, packaging material, to some quite plush, very nice, quite expensive um, configurations that you can find. This is the, yeah, pass that around, have a feel of it. This is the um, very sort of relatively naff basic type of lawn. This is the more expensive, and you can see it's quite advanced. It's polyurethane, poly polyethylene uh, fibers over a sort of nylon or um, polypropylene thatch base with the nice green fibers and then you know, bits of brown in there to make it look really realistic. It's a really um, sort of you know, advanced technology, if you like, in this sense. And this is what's termed third generation plastic turf. So the first generation was from the 60s, and there's a great Tomorrow's World episode from the 60s or the 70s, showing a guy who's installed this on his roof uh, and then he's hoovering it at the end um, for about five minutes um, in, on the show. And it's, you know, that's that, the old AstroTurf that would you know, skin, your, skin your knees on and all that kind of thing. Whereas this is much nicer, very soft, it feels great. Uh, normally it's installed um, over uh, crushed rock, not always, but usually you would have some, some kind of prep ground preparation that takes place before the grass is put over the top. So it's not just laid directly down onto the, uh, onto the soil. Uh, and that's for drainage, usually, to allow the water to drain through uh, as far as possible. It doesn't really work very well, uh, necessarily, as I'll talk about um, in a minute. It's not always used like that. It's used in domestic uh, lawns, but it's widely used in pub gardens. This, is, this was obviously a bit of a talking point done at the local pub. A uh, sofa with the plastic grass on it. I've seen the plastic grass suit, which I'd quite like to get. Um, if, I could, if I could afford it one day. Um, that's the dream. And this is my kids' school. So you can see they've installed plastic grass at the school because it you know, stops kids. You saw that recently the Eden Project had installed some to stop kids getting muddy. Um, that's what they've done here. So the kids that you know, aren't hurting themselves on the grass and so on. And sometimes it's just put down almost for no reason without any preparation on the ground. So I was in Lincoln, which is where I'm from originally in a car park, hanging out um, in my forties. <laughs> and this was a, a tree. And for some reason, I don't know why, they just put this, every tree in the car park had this plastic grass. I don't know, I don't know what the logic behind it was. It didn't even bother to stamp it down properly. So, but anyway, so you see it, you, know, you, know, you can see it in shop fronts and everything all over the place. So the reason, it's, the reason it's desired, the reason that people are doing it really is because it meets all the cultural requirements of what I turned earlier a good lawn. Okay, so it's, it looks like it's dominated by, it's not re really a good lawn, obviously, but it looks like it's dominated by grasses, there's no weeds, it's lovely and soft, if those samples are making their way around, you can feel it, it does feel quite nice. Lovely rich green colour rather than an unhealthy brown or yellow, so my neighbours have got it. Uh, and in the summertime, my grass looks, you know, horrible and yellow and dry, and theirs looks lovely and green because, you know, it's, it's fake. Um, a nice dense sward, so nice and thick. It looks like it's intensively managed, and therefore there's a kind of the moral worth element of it coming through there. It's lovely and neat, uh, and it's consistent. It's not patchy at all because it's all made, you know, to a specific density. So it addresses all of these aspirational things uh, in many cases. So this, this is just some of the examples from one particular website, oops, um, from one particular website of the different types of plastic grass that you can get. So this kind with the very short sward or pile, I suppose pile is the correct term for it, given that it's more carpet than, than grass. Um, this is for golf, so if you want a you know, plastic thing to practice your golf on, as is this one with the extra fibers to give extra cushioning and that kind of thing. You can get thinner pile, 
plush a pile, which is more expensive but feels much better. And if you fancy it, you can even get red or pink or blue <laughs> lawn. Um, I'm not sure who that's marketed at, um, but you can buy it. Um, can anyone tell, the resolution's not great on this, but can anyone tell out of these three, which is the real grass and which is the plastic? All right. It's this one. Right? So you can even buy it with the, the mowing stripes, which is, you know, that's good marketing. That's really good, you know, kudos there. Uh, yeah, I mean, so you, can, you, can, you can tell, obviously. When, when you, if you were standing where I am, you can see it much more clearly. It, it does look different when you're close up, but from a distance, you know, you can't really tell that easily. I've got my eye in now because there are loads of places near me. So uh, I'm always pointing out to the kids. And the kids don't care, but I think. <laughs> So one day I'll be famous for this. <laughs> and then, uh, not interested. So the, 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 from a philosophical point of view, I'm, re I'm really interested in this. There's a philosopher called uh, Jean Baudrillard who talks about simulation and simulacra, the idea of taking something which is real and creating a simulation of it and thereby destroying the thing that you're trying to simulate. Um, and I find this fascinating because it's kind of saying that the, the law and the plastic grass is sort of replacing the original lawn. Um, people are, there's a quote here, feigning what they don't have. They don't have a lawn. You've just got a plastic carpet on your front, you know, front of your house or whatever. It's not really a lawn. And it's, in a way, it's killing the lawn by replacing it with its, you know, fake artificial counterpart. I find that kind of idea really interesting because, it's, as I said before, it's kind of emerging for plants and trees, even like ro uh, robotic pets and things like that. People are, you know, starting to have those synthetic meat to an extent. So I've talked to Andrew a bit about some of this stuff synthetic nature. Um, it's a really interesting point um, that relates to you know, how we start to navigate our way through the non-human the non world, if you like. I'll come back to that at the end. Um, it normally spreads via a process which is common in sort of um, urban ecology, which is called neighborhood mimicry. So that's where you see someone else has got something in their garden. So they, they've got a certain type of tree, or they've got a pond, or they've got a patio. I want that. So they see the, the grass uh, and then go out and buy it. In some cases, there have been social media Cases. This was cited in a the Guardian article recently that was talking about the Eden Project. How this person, uh, Mish Hinch Home, has so many million followers or whatever it was, and, and tweeted this, and then the, the sales from the company that she used went through the roof because it was like, oh, I want plastic grass as well. Over 100 companies sell it in the UK. You can buy it in Tesco. Um, I'm not sure who goes into Tesco and comes out with a big roll of plastic grass. <laughs> but you can buy it in there because, as I said, I'm looking all the time for this stuff. Um, so that's all very well. That's why people are doing it, to an extent. What about the environmental impacts? Because that's the thing that most people immediately kind of say, well, you're replacing something living with something fake. So what's the environmental impact? So this is from a paper that I put together. When I first realized this was happening, I thought I'd better rush a paper out about this. So I wrote a kind of, not an opinion piece, but a sort of positioning piece, as we call it, to say, oh, this is probably bad, isn't it? Let's just think about the ways in which it might be bad. So the, if you look at the ecosystem services that a lawn provides, lawns aren't fantastic as an ecosystem anyway, to be fair. Um, but they can cover up to 75% of the city's land surface overall in some, in some parts of the world. So they, they are extensive. So if you think about the sort of things that they might do which are good, like infiltration, allowing water to soak in, storing the water, um, storing carbon as the plants grow, removing pollution from air and water, from the atmosphere, um, cooling the, the microclimate by evapotranspiration from the plant growth and all that kind of thing. All of that is removed or you know, very heavily reduced in a plastic lawn. They're not habitat for anything. They're not good for pollinators because there's nothing living on them apart from bacteria. They don't stabilize the soil because the soil's been replaced by crushed brick to an extent, but also there's no plant roots and things going into the soil that, you know, to kind of hold it all together. There's no nutrient cycling taking place because the dead material is just sort of washed off or removed. It doesn't actually kind of, you know, it's not incorporated into the soil in any, in any meaningful way. So that's all quite bad. We don't know, and this is an open question, to what extent having a plas plastic grass might improve or change or alter the recreation, the aesthetics, the way in which people use their gardens. We don't really know that yet in terms of whether people use them more or less or they don't like it or they do like it because it's quite a new sort of technology, I suppose. On the positive side, because there might be someone from a plastic grass company in the audience, uh, just in case, <laughs> and I'd like to keep working with them. don't want to upset them too much. Um, <clears throat> normal lawns will... The maintenance of them, you have to, you have to you know, cut them, all the electricity involved in that, you have to spray them with, with herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers and all those sorts of things. You don't do that on a plastic lawn, so there might be some savings there. They don't release nitrous oxide and methane. Um, they don't have invasive species that can spread because you know, urban gardens are a source of invasive species. And they don't have you know, 
pollen, flowers and pollen, all those sorts of things. So there are some potential benefits, I suppose, um, just to kind of be devil's advocate there. Um, but we've started a series of experiments now looking at the environmental impacts of plastic grass. So this was one that I did with a master's student uh, just as lockdown was starting a couple of years ago. Um, and this was a, a lab slash greenhouse experiment where basically we set up lots of different types of plastic grass alongside living grass that we grow into a specific density so they're all comparable and so on. And we wanted to look at if you put rainfall of different intensities on that grass, how much of it soaked through and how much of it just sort of bounced off the top. So that's the runoff and infiltration side. Runoff is the rainfall that hits the surface and then will flow off and go straight into the rivers or the, the drainage system or whatever happens to be. So we had this system set up <coughs> um, <coughs> like this. So it was installed in the way that we were told to install it by the manufacturer. So at the top there, you've got the living grass on top soil with a drainage layer at the bottom, two centimeters of limestone chippings. Then um, we had short artificial grass with sand and limestone chippings, then top soil, and then some more, another drainage layer, and then shorter grass um, below that. And we were trying to catch the runoff and then the water that filtered down and then basically made its way into a bucket uh, over time. And this was repeated multiple times over every day for 10 days. So we repeated the experiment to replicate it um, as far as possible. We published this in um, Urban Forestry and Urban Greening just recently. And I'm only going to show a couple of examples from this, but just to illustrate the point, this is the runoff. So this is the amount of water that runs straight off after the rainfall event. So on living grass, you can see there's no runoff at all. All the water that hits that living grass, that living lawn, soaks into the soil. Artificial grass, this is a percentage volume, so proportion. Um, <coughs> some goes to runoff. Long artificial grass, the vast majority of the water just runs straight off. It just bounces off all the, the grass and, and, and goes to the, you know, to drain away. Um, and that, there's more of that at the less intense rainfall, the 750 millilitres rather than the, the 1250, we think, because with more rainfall, it, push, it sort of squashes the grass down a bit and then more can kind of filter through and get into the drainage layer and so on. So the implication of that is that it's not very good for flooding, for, you know, for storing water in, this, in the city uh, and increasing the risk of flooding, because obviously impermeable surface cover in cities is quite high. We don't want lots of water running off because it's more likely to cause localised drainage issues and all that, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and the quote at the top there, I found these percentages from a study. It's basically, in, in, some, in some cases, the same as having the tarmacadam or asphalt. So it's a bit like paving your garden in a way in terms of the amount of rain, um, runoff that you get from a rainfall event, at least at first. Uh, and this is also shown in the amount of water that's retained as well. So there is more water retained after drainage has occurred um, in living grass than there is for short grass and for the, the plastic grass. And that water is really important for organisms that would be in the soil and you know, allowing plants to grow and all that kind of thing, and for just you know, stopping, stopping flooding. We also found microplastics being shed in the water that was coming off this, in the, the grass in this experiment. Um, and this is just to show you, this is some other samples that I received through the post. Um, and this is the, all the, the plastic microfibers that were in the bag when I opened it. Um, so some of that's rubber crumbs, some of it's nylon, some of it's polyurethane and so on. And we're at a point where we're trying to reduce plastic usage, trying to stop micro, microplastics going into the environment. And of course, this stuff will wear over time and it will contribute microplastics um, into the rivers and so on. Urban heat island, obviously cities are warmer than the surrounding countryside. Um, there have been experiments that have shown um, significant temperature differences between living grass and plastic grass. Um, one study here just showing significantly greater temperatures. This one from Hong Kong showing essentially a, a double temperature from the plastic grass. 72 degrees Celsius is pretty hot for a, you know, for a, for, to, to stand on. That, that was from a, you know, a playing a, a artificial turf um, sports pitch in Hong Kong. So it was under a lot of sunlight. So it's going to be pretty hot. And I was going to be using it at that point. But nonetheless, it just kind of shows that it retains heat. It's going to make the urban heat island effect worse to the extent that actually it melts. So this is the case where um, you know, the light's reflected off this window, it's heated up that plastic and it's sank and yeah, it's very funny. Uh, so now you have to buy a bit of window film for your turf to put over your window to stop your grass from melting. So that's a, that's a 21st century problem, isn't it? Um, but most of the questions remain around the ecological impacts. That's what we don't know yet. We don't know how important it is to, you know, for stopping soil organisms from being able to, to, to survive and all those sorts of things. That's what the next the next bit of work is going to be on. But some work that I've done with Andrew on the social side was looking at why people are installing artificial grass. So we had a netnographic analysis 
um, of discussion posts from Mumsnet. And we use Mumsnet because that is a kind of a, a, an online fora or forum where people are quite happy to talk about these sorts of things, right? Without any particular kind of, you know, judgment. Um, we found this really interesting. So about 20% of people were in favor of artificial grass and were arguing for it. About 15% were arguing against it. And the rest of the people weren't really sure. They were just sort of asking questions like, should I do it? Is it good? Is it bad? How does it work? Those sorts of things. And we looked through all those posts and divided them into emotional uh, responses, pe how people felt about it, the biophysical affects, and that was like concerns about the impact it might have on the environment, those sorts of things. And then environmental values of the people themselves. So, you know, how um, people sort of navigated the idea of replacing a lawn with, with plastic. So I've just got a few kind of quotes here. So from the emotional responses, these were those against artificial grass wanted, they thought it was tacky, basically. They wanted the, the neighbourhood to look really, really nice. So they were concerned about partly the environmental side of it, but also if it looked fake. So, you know, I hate the look, overcompensating by planting loads and loads of container plants because we found that people felt guilty about installing artificial grass. So they then say, well, I'm going I'm to put loads of planters out. I'm going to put some trees and, uh, and so on. Um, <clears throat> other people saying that they... They like the appearance and the lack of maintenance. It's the best thing they ever did. We can use the garden 365 days a year. And you can completely see that, you know, if you're an elderly couple or you're disabled or whatever, actually, probably it does make the garden more useful. It probably is a good thing in that sense. Uh, but there was a lot of concern with it being the right kind of artificial grass. It had to look good. So it had to be the expensive kind, not the kind of cheap brush green stuff that I circulated uh, a minute ago. The other thing that from the biophysical affects was concerns over contamination emotions of fear and disgust this was quite a common one people saying well how clean is it what if my kids play on it and then the, the birds have, have pooed all over it so this is my neighbor's artificial grass and i'll tell you where i live um uh, and i very kindly highlighted all the dog turds that they'd leave on their grass for days on end which used to really cheer me up when i got up in the morning and opened the curtains and see loads of dog poo over the plastic grass um, and the irony there is that they sold the house and recently another couple moved in and they ripped it up straight away. Um, and of course it went straight to landfill because it can't be recycled. So it's, you know, it's, it's just complete waste. Um, so, but the other element of it, of course, keeping it clean, you have to keep it clean. It's not maintenance free. People have to hoover it, you know, clean it. Um, sometimes it gets hot, as we mentioned, so they have to put blankets down or people feel stupid when they're, when they're hoovering it and so on. <laughs> and then... <laughs> Ecological concerns um, about it, again, it being a, no, a lower class of neighbour. So when I was looking at houses, it was a real turn off. It's bad for the environment. You know, it's obviously bad for, for species and concerns about that. But other people saying, well, the downsides are obviously environmental. We're trying to offset that. Some saying, I don't care. I don't get on with anyone. I'm a horrid, selfish person. Don't give a <laughs> but I've got a nice, I've got a nice garden now. So take that. Um, so it's be just fine. And then the old, the, 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 the kind of the, the trumping element, which is, well, I've got, all right, I've got, you criticise me for having plastic grass, but, you know, do you power your shower with a pedal bike? Ha! <laughs> that kind of, you know, which doesn't really, you know, doesn't really wash. So anyway, lots of concerns. To the extent, it really does polarise people, to the extent there's been attempts to ban it, petitions put together to try to persuade Parliament to ban plastic grass. This one failed, didn't get high enough, so the government has no plans to ban the use of, uh, of artificial grass. There's another one that apparently... Uh, now taking place now to try and get people to to ban it um, <clears throat> companies are aware of this they're aware of the potential environmental risks and impacts to the extent that they've now released a, a type of grass called air air grass which has got titanium dioxide in it um, the idea that what titanium dioxide does is uh, it catalyzes a reaction for uh, nitrogen oxide which is a type of pollution to get rid of that from the air the problem with that is that the byproducts of it are nitrites, which are um, eutrophy the water, so they're a pollution in themselves, polluted in themselves, and also carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, right? So it doesn't necessarily solve anything. It doesn't work necessarily for a long period of time. They use it in around the city anyway. It's often painted on buildings as a kind of way of trying to you know prevent the worst elements of pollution. So on. what annoys me a little bit is that they then call it eco-friendly. It's not eco-friendly. <laughs> Uh, because it's plastic grass. It's not eco-friendly. Just because it's slightly, slightly less worse than the other kinds doesn't make it eco-friendly. But nonetheless, there's this, there's this sort of battleground being drawn, I think, about the use of it. And the reason that I found this interesting, 
as an urban ecologist is because we're trying to find ways to live, let me finish now, so just in case, um, trying to find ways to live alongside lots of nature in cities. So uh, an urban ecologist called Oliver Gilbert in, in the 90s, in one of, his, one of his books, wrote that the most appropriate method of accommodation in wildlife is still undecided. And that's still true now. So on the one hand, we're trying to do wildlife gardening. We're trying to create green walls and, and green roofs and all those sorts of things to try to find more ways of species living alongside us in the city and you know, sharing our space with other animals. But at the same time, we're ecologically simulating you know, lawns and things like that by having plastic alternatives to the real thing. And I find that a fascinating sort of you know, divergence of approaches from the one hand to the other. Uh, and this is the, the, the other alternative to a lawn. So if you don't want a grass lawn, you want it a bit more maintenance free, that kind of thing, you can have a tapestry lawn. This is from Avondale Park in London. And the idea here is that, you know, you don't need the lots of the monoculture of grasses. You can have wildflowers that are very dense and thick and that, you know, produce lots of good things for pollinators and so on. But you can have a picnic on that. You can walk on it perfectly fine. It's exactly the same as a normal lawn, but you don't need to, to, to maintain it in the same kind of a way. It's not a simplified ecosystem in the same kind of a way. Um, you know, and it's much better for biodiversity and to live alongside you know, lots, lots of other species. And then I'll just finish on this. I thought this is quite a nice sentiment. I was in Asia and I took this photo. Of, they often use it as, as a way of kind of greening the streets, making the street look a bit greener, even though it's obviously plastic. Um, and I like this sentiment here. It's up to you what your world looks like. I thought it was really nice, but it was slightly harmed by the fact that, that this was on the side of a pub and they'd done it you know, in, plastic, in, pl in plastic plants. Um, so it's like well-intentioned, but it's like maybe that's not quite the right kind of message, <laughs> message to send. Um, <clears throat> so I'll stop there because I've probably gone on for longer than 20 minutes. Am I sorry? Um, so any questions? We're going to take like maybe, I don't know, three questions now. And then uh, if there's any more at the end. I know sometimes it's hard, like you're put on the spot. <gasps> okay, we have one. Brilliant. We don't, um, and we've looked at that because it's, it's quite hard to kind of. I, so I've walked around bits of Milton Keynes and try, I, don't, I don't live in Milton Keynes, but uh, it's the nearest big city to me. So I've walked around to try to get gauge an idea of how many people have got it from subsampling. It's quite hard though because people tend to have it in their back gardens, not their front. So what we're doing now is um, I've worked with Martin Worcester, who's a remote uh, Earth observation scientist, basically, to look at the spectral imagery of the grass. So we've got some thermal imaging, um, thermal, Im thermal camera images from an aeroplane. And you can work out if it looks green, but it gives the same reflectance as concrete. It's probably plastic grass. So we're doing that at the minute to try and get some idea of, of how much there is. Because there's low, I mean, there's, there's tons of it around everywhere. So it tends to be quite, quite small patches, which is a bit hard, but yeah, we're trying to quantify that a little bit. Was there a uh, Have uh, been working on an actual eco-friendly alternative to so <laughs> materials so that would have the benefits of plastic grass but without the negative? Not that I know of, not that I know of, although I could see how that would potentially... There is a hybrid, because someone saw an article that I was quoted in The Guardian recently about the Eden Project, and someone emailed me um, from is I think it's the Islington Council, where basically they'd said for this playing playground they, they wanted to put in hybrid, which is 90% real and 10% fake. Not quite sure how they do it, um, but the idea that it, it stops the real stuff wearing away quite so fast. So that's maybe like an acceptable alternative. And they the local people have campaigned against it and got them to overturn the decision to use it uh, because they hated the idea of it so much. So. That hybrid idea is certainly being done, although I don't know how, but I don't know about anything else that's happening at the minute in terms of alternative, you know, biodegradable plastic or something like that, maybe. Yeah, although, how much people pay for it, I don't know in that case. Yeah. But yeah, thanks. In terms of what, sorry, the, like the correlation that like green parts and stuff, you know, associate like well being and like is that much to show like Oh, for the, for the plastic like, kind. Yeah, right, so this is the other sort of really interesting question that I wanted to, to, and I was going to do something on this before COVID hit with um, an artist associated with King. We, want, we don't know the answer to that. So there is a lot of evidence that people gain 
you know, you can take more stress, you can take more pain, you feel much better and calmer when you're in greenery, right? Whatever kind of greenery that is. And we don't know if the response is the same for an artificial plant from a real one. Anecdotally, it suggests it is. So students that have got a fake plant in their room get the same concentration benefits as students that have got a real plant in their room, it seems. So we wanted to, we wanted to settle some um, installations that were kind of completely fake and completely real and then get people to kind of do you know, like heart rate measurements and stuff like that. We couldn't do it in the end because of COVID, but um, yeah. Can they be, sorry, jumping in there. <laughs> um, if you've got houseplants, but you're not really looking after them and they keep dying, would that perhaps outweigh the positive <laughs> benefits of having well, that them? Is, Whereas, that, you know, that, that is me. I can't, I, can't, I can't make anything grow. I can't at all. Um, yeah, no, potentially. Yeah, yeah, I think in some circumstances. And again, if people are overcompensating by having a bit of plastic, but then putting lots of planters and wildflowers mm. and things, you know, in that sense, maybe it's not quite quite so bad. Yeah. Given that there's so much get around already, is it really hard to get around the ecosystem? Yeah, probably. Not. I don't. I don't think it will ever get banned. So, someone interviewed me the other day. Um, I was asking about this. Said, did I think there should be a policy change where it was where it was banned? But if you're gonna if you're gonna ban plastic grass you'd have to ban loads of other stuff as well i think at the same time and like stop i know they've introduced a rule where you can't pave your driveway anymore is that right you can't replace your lawn with paving or something in london i'm sure it's something about that whether there would be something like that potentially but I th yeah it's unlikely that it would get banned i think to be honest yeah do you think that this usage will increase in the future as we are facing droughts yes yeah droughts and things yeah i think so yeah i mean it's because it looks nice it, it wouldn't surprise me I think a lot of people they don't want to do the maintenance. Grass doesn't grow very well in cities for various reasons. You know, yeah, it's, a, it's an easy thing to do. So I imagine that's why it's in Tesco and, you know, Costco and so on. Wherever you go, it's, you can buy it. So. Yeah, I have a uh, oh, health question. Yeah. So this has been around for, what, like 30, 40 years? Um, have they looked at, like, the health impacts of the microplastics? Because now we know we can find in our lungs, in our colon, it's everywhere. Yes. So have they looked at, you know, whether or not people who've installed this for years have um, had more health issues so linked to microplastics. Not on the inhalation side of things, because that's quite that's quite new. Most of the work that's been done on artificial grass or artificial turf in the past has been done on sort of sports pitches because most of the concern was about uh, athletes injuring themselves. And because on an AstroTurf pitch they use rubber crumb, uh, which is carcinogenic in the so most of the concern was about if athletes get cuts and then you know they get rubber crumb inside and it's carcinogenic, all that kind of stuff. Rubber crumb isn't used in the domestic side very much, but I think there's still a lot of concern from people. Not, no research has been done on the domestic side, but there's a lot of concerns from people about their kids and dogs and things like that playing on the grass and potentially getting chemicals from the plastics and all those sorts of things, yeah. yeah. Do we have a final question before we go to the break? Um, Ooh, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll take two. 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 Yeah, you go first. All right. Uh, so, like, you mentioned at the beginning that the idea of the law is quite deeply rooted yeah. and, you know, steeped in history and stuff. Could you make the case, I'm going to go to bat for plastic grass, that um, it's kind of democratising and making that idea a bit more accessible to people who might not want to shout out for gardeners? I suppose, like yeah, looking at it like that, maybe, I don't know whether people care about it whether the, the the common person if you like the person who doesn't have a large amount of private green space and so on cares whether the neighborhood cares about it that much but you're right in the sense that yeah it, it does make that cultural ideal available for anyone who wants it even if it's artificial it's very yes i don't yeah, know how yeah. much a proper law costs compared to a, to a plastic one yeah, yeah, yeah. Like um plastic grass it's about per square meter it's yeah, 40, 40, 50 quid, something like that. So a normal lawn is probably cheaper overall. So all you do is just sort of mow it now and again, then it's probably all right. But yeah, it depends on having the space, the time, and, and all those sorts of things as well. And it's no mow May, isn't it, today, uh, this this month? So yeah, don't, don't mow your lawn. And if it's plastic grass, certainly don't mow it. Um, there was a council that sent someone to, they forgot they put plastic grass down and sent someone with a strimmer. <laughs> To trim it, that's just quite funny. Do you have to replace it often, like maybe with, with a plastic Christmas tree that starts looking a well, bit tired? Well, I was told about 10 years is the expected lifespan of a plastic lawn, so I don't know how accurate that is, but yeah. Do you want to ask 
Yes. Yeah, so my question was, um, like, in the 80s, 90s, it was a patio, right? So, yeah. oh, I want it to be easy, I don't have to mow it, right, put a patio there. Do you have any idea patio versus artificial lawn? Mm. I don't know. I suppose if it's a porous paving, then maybe the patio might be. But it wouldn't, if it's just pure concrete. I mean, I don't know about the kind of the the uh, manufacturing carbon footprint side of things, concrete versus plastic. And, and yeah. Like, yeah. But yeah, probably similar, I would say, in many cases. Yeah, I don't know. I should, yeah, I should do a, a actual comparison. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So. Do as far as I know, it's manufactured for it. The, 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 the plastic grass companies know that there should be a, like a duty of care. So what they want to do is have a kind of life cycle thing where they install it and then when it gets old, they remove it and then it's recycled properly. At the minute, I don't think that kind of capacity exists and the facilities don't exist. So in America, apparently there are warehouses full of plastic grass waiting to catch on fire and be toxic because they you know it's just it's basically it's all sorry it's all um you know landfill or storage until they work out what to do with it and if it does burn down or something it's extremely toxic i wanted to burn some in the lab to, but martin won't let me because we haven't got the right filters to but yeah so okay that's all the time for yeah sorry <laughs>
why is it that every time one sees a Staffordshire Bull Terrier walking down the street, the chances are that, that the man at the other end of the lead has an IQ at submoronic level? <laughs> and a swagger that suggests an undeserved level of personal confidence. I have nothing against the dogs, West writes. <laughs> But many of the owners are a waste of oxygen. <laughs> and the subtitle of this piece was Why the Underclass is Bad for the Environment. Uh, kind of further animate, an animating West's barely concealed rage. Now this sort of sub, this kind of signals a particular message, a particular connotation between a dog like the Staffordshire Bull Terrier and the Labrador. But which of these dogs is responsible for the most injuries of postal workers in the UK? is of course the Labrador, not a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. But we associate, we attribute to these dogs different characteristics. Okay, moving on. <laughs> switching uh, London, or switching the UK or England for the US. In the US, poodles, uh, terrier mixes, chihuahuas, and Yorkies have been noted as gentrifying breeds. They accompany the kind of progression and a change of different, so different areas of the city. Here in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, we see a dog uh, ice cream van. Let me get the name of this. This is Milo's kit. No, sorry, this is Frosty Pooch, which uh, serves dog ice cream. Uh, there's also Milo's Kitchen. Uh, and, but I mean, dog, dog ice cream is actually quite common in the UK now. Marshfields, a big brand in the south, southwest of England, they do different dog based flavors, I guess. Uh, and increasingly, dogs are seen as a kind of a child substitute as part of the family, a part of the household, as a permanent part of the household, in particular for childless uh, families. And dogs, pampered pets, benefit from things like yoga classes, beauticians, uh, as well as the dog food trucks. You know, see, these are hipster dogs, they don't go anywhere for their doggy ice cream, but a, a food <laughs> truck. Um, and this has actually almost a more serious angle, if we think, returning back to the UK, here we have a development in Wembley Park. Um, housing can also be determined or by dogs. Um, this development, the Lansbury Buildings uh, in Wembley Park, which has 295 rental flats, is available to both human and animal tenants. Uh, but there's a catch. The dog um, tenant has to go under a selection interview, uh, <laughs> whereby Frankie the Cavapoo will uh, interview the dogs and give them a... Uh, a wag of the tail if they're, <laughs> if they're selected. Uh, after passing their selection interview, they get a dog gaddy, uh, goodie bag and access to dedicated dog runs within this development. 295 flats in London here. Uh, one bedroom apartment starts at 1,800 pounds a month plus an additional 50 pounds for the dog. Uh, there's no knowing for sure what type of dog Frankie the Cavapoo um, admits, but I'm, wi I'm willing to think it's gonna be more on the Labrador end of the spectrum than the Staffordshire Bull Terrier. But here you can see this kind of dog um, class reproduction occurring in the city. All right, so that's some examples close to home. But I want to, as someone who works more in the global south than the global north, I always like to take the antipodal view and think about cities elsewhere. I'm an urban geographer who's interested in uneven development and inequality across different scales. So is this just something which is curious and interesting for us here in London or in New York? or does it also have resonance in Johannesburg or Maputo or Harare in Zambia, Zimbabwe? So across Southern Africa, uh, the dog is a very racially charged symbol. So associated not just with class, but um, socially produced ethnic differences. The, re the region, of course, has a troubled recent past of apartheid and post-colonial legacies. Uh, white re minority regimes and colonialism is intrinsically associated with particular dog breeds. Uh, one such breed is uh, the Rhodesian Ridgeback, this guy here. Now, <laughs> the Rhodesian Ridgeback, when dogs were kind of given their, I don't know, by, let's, let's say God, was given their, <laughs> give, given their jobs, you're the golden retriever, you're the sausage dog, <laughs> Rhodesian Ridgeback, you're the lion hunter. So this dog's job was to, um, to hunt for lions. Not to actually catch the lion, but by, uh, by the kind of great white hunter was to kind of make darting runs at a lion to distract their attention whilst they got shot. So the Rhodesian Ridgeback was part of the kind of colonial landscape. Uh, it's one of the three um, 
indigenous Southern African breeds. Um, the other one is the Boer Boar. Um, and living, uh, when I first was living in Mozambique, I was staying in a compound uh, owned by some South Africans and they had some Boer Boars there and they were absolutely tiring, terrifying. They, well, they were towering as well as terrifying. They're up like here, their heads like the size of a motorbike helmet, probably about thick. Slobbering, great big jaws. They look like they could rip your arm off. They were the most terrifying dogs I'd ever imagined. And so these two, Rovies and Ridgeback, associated with clonal hunting. Burble, a kind of vicious security dog. And then thirdly up there, we see uh, German Shepherd dogs associated with the apartheid regime and policing of the city. It goes so far as in some um, instances, uh, South African dogs historically were trained on the scent of, scents of black men. Bloodhounds were trained to find and locate black bodies rather than white bodies, or at least the scents associated with them or imagined to be associated with those breed, with those, sorry, sorry, that was a slip, with those uh, different groups of people. Okay, and I continue. Um, into the 21st century, um, across post-colonial Southern Africa, City, in, certain, in many cities, these white breeds are still associated, or so-called white breeds, are associated with particular parts of the city, with securitizing space, with delimitating areas of affluence from areas of impoverishment. But of course, as the, as the city changes, the dog breeds also change in tandem with it. In Cape Town in South Africa, um, a city of immense social inequalities, you can demark areas of affluence and impoverishment partially between racial lines, but also increasingly between dog population lines. These dogs find in affluent parts and other dogs found in impoverished parts. And what are these so-called other dogs? Now here, in using some of my research, I don't necessarily spend my time in the lab with the watering can and some artificial glass. <laughs> I sit at home and read some novels, have a nice cup of tea. Uh, but one of the books I draw upon here in some of these arguments is by uh, J.M. Coots, the uh, novel Disgrace. Uh, which is associated with, actually, actually the protagonist of this is a European academic, so it's really getting, <laughs> it's, it's in close, it's in close there. But anyway, the, um, the reason I invoke this book is the, on the front cover here, we have the Africanis, which is the third uh, Southern African indigenous dog. Um, it's a medium sized dog. It's kind of, it, in some ways it may be familiar with a pie dog. Has anyone heard of the, the pie dog of South Asia? This is the idea of a kind of dog, which is most dog-like of a dog. It's kind of like, if you almost see who's a back breed a dog, it would appear like this dog. Um, but, um, and here using the language which uh, Coots um, invokes in his book, is it's uh, re uh, referred to by the kind of disgusting racial epitaph of the Kaffir dog, a dog which is associated with black po populations and in the racially charged language of the text is associated with, um, uh, with black identity and is invoked as being kind of mongrel and worthless and low class. So again, drawing upon that language and thinking about the situation of that dog is very different to the kind of the pure, so-called pure breeds of the German Shepherds, the Boer Boars, and Ridgebacks associated with the white parts of the city. So we have these cities of Southern Africa divided between white and black dogs, um, uh, or, or historically so. But we know South Africa is evolving, is changing, is um, becoming a... a um, increasingly, well, a different type of society, a society where the lines of inequality are not so much drawn across racial um, differentiators, but across, by across um, financial disparities. Since the collapse of colonialism and the fall of apartheid, the divisions in dog, dog ownership have begun to break down. Uh, moving not from, from, sorry, moving from South Africa to Harare uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, increasingly, black middle classes have protected their smart new homes with the same vicious god do guard dogs favoured by the old white colonials, colonialised people, some of which have left Zimbabwe uh, under racial tensions. But they continue to protect the property in the same way as they did when their owners or their keepers were, were white. Uh, back in South Africa, Jamin, Jacob Zuma, the former, uh, prime, uh, former president, is unhappy with new attitudes towards the dog. In 2012, the president went as far to argue that those that loved their pay pets more than people suffered a lack of humility. He equated dog care with white culture and, and, and chided blacks that spent lavishly on their dogs, walked them or took them to the vet. 
as being, as lack, as being outside of African culture. Um, uh, and to quote another uh, uh, writer, this is a Zimbabwean author called uh, Shimina uh, Chinuda, in his short story, Strays, writes, A dog is a dog. The average African dog is a little less than a dog. The average African dog is a creature that you kicked, scolded, and have missiles thrown at, at it. Whereas a European dog is more than a dog. It's a member of the family, with a personality, name, a kennel, veterinary card, and of course a budget. A suburban African dog, so a gentrifying African dog, is an aspiring middle-class household, is sometimes somewhere between the two, which benefits uh, from the examples of its white neighbour and remains a household appendage. So the dog lines are changing. The geography of dogs, the dog inhabitants of the city, are changing with new patterns of gentrification and some of the breaking down of the old uh, racial barriers. Um, yeah, so this speaks to this. We can see now here some black handlers with uh, German Shepherd dogs, a uh, boar boar being looked after by a uh, young black guy. Um, and even the Africanis has had a bit of a rehabilitation. It can increasingly be found in white households. Uh, indeed, there's, some, there's kind of been a strange sort of marrying between uh, Africana culture, the white Africans, and the Africanis dog, who tried to rehabilitate it and kind of nurtured it as a member of, uh, of their community. Picked up on piece of paper. Okay, so switching not back to home, but back to the global north. Uh, we've got two dogs here. One of them is a. <laughs> well, one Snoop Dog and one's. Uh... <laughs> uh, that's. One Snoop Dogg, and actually we're not, we're not actually talking about Snoop Dogg's the, he's the background, the foreground is Machitou, uh, a French Bulldog. Uh, and Machitou is not just any dog, he's not with us anymore. Snoop Dogg's still here, but Machitou's gone. Um, and Machitou um, is infamous because he's maybe not the first, but he's probably the most famous clone dog in the world. Uh, so his owner, um, uh, sadly in, I think it was 2020, Machitou uh, departed this earth. Um, and one of the tendencies of dog owners is they like to replace their dog with a new dog of the same breed. Think of the queen, she's either lacking in originality or really loves corgis. I don't know, I don't know one of the two. Um, but yeah, there's a tendency that once you buy, uh, once you get attached to one breed of dog, that you reproduce it in the same way that we like to re reproduce social classes and we give uh, inheritance to our, well, we don't give it, we bequeath inheritance to our. So our family members, we like to kind of sustain a dog line within the family. Um, that's something that seems to be quite a common, common pattern. Um, and, but this has gone even further to the extent that which the, if you have the money, uh, $50,000, uh, you can clone your pet and have a, an exact genetic replica reborn. And indeed, this happened with Matcha 2. Uh, this is dead Matcha 2. This is new Matcha 2. Or it's actually... Matchy two. <laughs> it was actually no. It's actually written as a two. So it's actually so the name the the birth certificate's not right here. So, uh, but yeah, he was actually named Matchy two, and this is the dog of Roberto Novo. Um, here's Roberto. Uh, he's a famous um, hairdresser. Uh, I don't know any famous hairdressers myself. <laughs> but he's, uh, he's been responsible for Britney Spears and other people. I guess that's how he knows Snoop Dogg. Um, um, but he. Um, to ease his pangs of loneliness following the departure of his beloved Machi 2, he paid $50,000 to have the dog cloned and reproduced as an as exact genetic re replica. Uh, and in so doing, this new um, Machi 2 uh, will um, take the place of the former one, but how will it develop? It will be exposed to different stimuli, uh, both biological and environmental. Um, although its uh, genetic identity may be similar, will it take on the same characteristics as its forebearer? Who knows? But what we do, and what we, what I do know, is that Machu Two will now be a, a kind of an inhabitant of New York City, an affluent inhabitant of New York City. Someone who's probably a, a semi-permanent, if not permanent, member of a gentrified or a hyper-affluent part of the city. So perhaps dogs such as Machu Two are making a claim and ownership to the city in a way that we can't, a way that they're even kind of expressing their genes onto a new generation, which 
I don't know if any of us are, that any of us will do in a, such a direct way as, as is done by uh, this particular dog species. So what have dogs placed in a city? Well, they already have a big paw print of the city as residents, as security guards, as life companions. And some such as Machutu are integral parts of super affluent households. Um, with the development of new technologies such as cloning, is it possible that dog populations become permanent residents and even owners of the city uh, with rights which might exceed those of some people? And I'll leave it at that. they're bracky settled, like, you know, like a pub or something that you can't fly on a plane for health reasons. Mm -hmm. There are breeds that they will absolutely exclude from allowing on planes, ferries, wherever. Do you, what are your thoughts on, on you know, excluding these types of breeds that may or may, you know, may be less dangerous than, for example, your golden retriever? And do you think there's a connection there between, you know, a subliminal exclusion of a certain part of the population by not allowing them to insure their pets or not allowing them to travel with their pets? I mean, it's, a, it's a bit far-fetched, but it's the first thing that popped into my head when I saw it. Yeah, no, thanks for that. And I think I should probably speak to a little bit some of the depth behind this research, because I sort of glossed over that. There's a paper in Progress in Human Geography with Phil Hubbard where we go into some of these issues in maybe a little bit greater depth. And I think one of the things which is certainly dem dem or one can demonstrate is that there's a strong association between dogs and human identity, and the dog becomes a cipher for humanity. So it's very literally kind of your outrider when you walk. It's literally there in front of you. It's kind of a, a path maker that you maybe encounter the dog before you encounter the person. And I think that that sort of does map on to the way in which people make massive assumptions about identity based on dogs. So there's one kind of most literal kind of, it's difficult to kind of evidence exactly what you say, but there's a, in terms of tenancy, tenancy agreements, there's often a distinguishing, like a kind of ambiguous, Big dog, yes. Small dog, no. And I think that's something which isn't necessarily done on, like, particularly on mass, but on a kind of appraisal of the dog. So yeah, so I don't think I don't think it's say codified. And because, of course, anyone who encounters dogs knows their individual kind of. I don't like to use the word personality with dogs because I think person is a person, but the kind of characteristics of dogs, the the non-human personality of dogs, is maybe more important than the breed, but. Anybody else? Yeah. I was going to ask what about cats. <laughs> <laughs> what, is about, what is it about a dog that maybe is so effective in these forms of like urban space and creation of urban space that, say, other pets <laughs> um, don't maybe have so much effect? Well, I'm allergic to cats, so. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, so I mean, in terms of, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I think like, yeah, d a dogs maybe do have that, that companionship. I don't know how deeply rooted that is. And I mean, I probably have to ask a, yeah, an anthropologist or a, 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 yeah, more of a scientist than me about that. But yeah, I think, I don't know. I don't, I think there's something, yeah, particular about dogs. And I think there's a kind of, it flips both ways in terms of the companionship, but also the fear element. I think, I think dogs are used to police and securitize space in a way that no other animal is so i think they have that that assertiveness and that aggressiveness is something which that kind of duality of dogs is not something you find in any other animal which i think that's probably a defining characteristic in terms of the securitization of the city as well as the sort of um softer feeling of the city um anybody else yes um, i'm interested in what you were saying about uh, like the mixed breed dogs um and just uh, like you know that this need to have like purebred or like even like genetically bred or whatever you know and, and mixed breeders seem to be lesser than i think and i just wondered if like you had anything more to say about that because uh, i thought it was just interesting like in terms of um, race and um, state 
status and stuff like this in society, you know, and, and maybe like, you know, is, what's happening to like mixed breed dogs? I mean, even in like London or something in society, you know, is it? Because uh, we don't have as many strays over here, obviously. Yeah. So, like a ship. I guess, I mean, dog status, dog is more codified than human status, is that we might think we're members of a middle class, upper class, but how do you identify that? Is that identified through your employment, through what music you listen to, through your kind of cultural sensibilities, what newspaper you read? Is it about your ancestry? Is it about who your parents were, who your grandparents were? Whereas for a dog, a pedigree dog, you can kind of trace their bloodline back through generations. Maybe more so even, unless you're kind of a member of the aristocracy, it's, it's probably quite difficult for you to trace yourself back through so many generations. Whereas many dogs, when you purchase them, you can kind of get a real sort of genetic map of that. So in the most extreme examples, I think dog class is more codified than human class. So there's a potential for that to be seen as a kind of greater. Um, uh, and then, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a, but there's a evolving fashions, the kind of, the Cavapoo was the kind of lockdown darling, wasn't it? I mean, we should have all put our money into Tesla stocks and Cavapoos and we'd all be millionaires. <laughs> and, but yeah, so there's, I think there is that sort of like, there's an evolution, but there's also kind of something like the bloodlines, unless they're defined as so, as so important in dog status. Sort of jumping off that, you mentioned the idea of animal agency or dog agency. Does that answer you just give kind of contradict that because it's a very, human creation, the idea of breeds and the, the designation of these specific characteristics. The dog doesn't know that it's a certain breed. Maybe it does, we can't ask it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get all of it, Richard Dawson, in this, because I think it's about replication of genes, I think, at the most fundamental level, in terms of thinking about the permanence of a dog species in the city. So I think that maybe the, the, the absence of agency is maybe secondary to the present to the agency which is performed through inheritance of characteristics so to me that's how like dog populations persist in a in a city yeah any other questions from the audience uh yeah yeah so different dog breeds they represent like different foods to us uh, but what do you think we can learn from researching like like dogs, like what dogs are, like people in society, what kind of teachers about society or like? Yeah, well, I wouldn't kind of divorce dogs and society. I think society is influenced by not just the presence of people, but the presence of many other things, like the presence of everything from antigens, which make us behave in different ways, to viruses, to animal populations. So a lot of my work, I look at like how animal populations kind of evolve and shape cities. So I don't, I'm actually don't really know much about dogs. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> but what I do know is um, urban geography works in cities. So I've done work on how, uh, how oysters are reshaping Whitstable Bay, how um, Lisbon is being in relationship with sardines is remaking that city. And on this, uh, this is a, uh, a piece of work which is part of a, a larger book project, but thinking about how dog populations are maybe shaping urban spaces in general. So I would say that kind of many of those different animals uh, alongside kind of other non-humans shape and make society. So I wouldn't divide society from a nature in that respect. But, but with dogs, things. because they're pets, like people purchase them. So it's like more of a, like the people in society, they purchase a type of dog because they associate an idea with it, like Labrador or more high class than another dog. So I just was wondering like, yeah. I, I think like wildlife in cities, they don't, like you don't purchase them, they just exist and they shape the city, so this goes also like there's more of an interaction I think, between like the point of society and yeah. yeah, I mean I think certainly a yeah, dog is within capitalist social, social relations is commodified, but I think it's almost like do you buy the dog because you're high class or does the dog make you high class, so like, so what is the kind of agency within that relationship? that do we construct our kind of social status not just through our ability to have money but our ability to kind of reimagine ourselves through purchasing particular things by behaving in a particular way so in that respect is the dog is the dog the static and the other and the the, the human the 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 thing which is moving so i don't know i mean i'm not i'm not disagreeing with you i think it's just sometimes it's a way to to flip it round and don't think of us think of nature as something we co-produce rather than which is outside of the human. Yeah.
there's definitely a paper in aspirin, aspirational dog purchasing to be had. Uh, yeah, we have one new question at the back. First, we've got loads of questions right now. Yeah? Oh, would you say that for dogs in particular, like, you know, when, when people have dogs, they you take them out to public spaces, like on walks and things, and like, like people who have dogs meet other people who have dogs, that, does that play into like the social role of dogs a lot? Because, you know, you need the one other test, and it's a very, dogs are seen in public more than associated. That's like very visibly associated to the owners. So sort of like parading the dog yeah. out for it to be seen and how does that walking play into it? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess that's an element of dog agency. So one of the things I've posited was the idea that dogs might have agency. So maybe if you're not someone who's naturally going to stop a stranger and say, oh, yeah, I like your hat. Oh, where do you get those shoes? <laughs> but actually you say, but he's, he, he can very, it's completely acceptable. He goes, oh, I love your dog. Oh, I can't touch him. Like, the, the instantly that dog kind of gives you, the, it gives you a role in the city. It's a conversation starter. It, it's a wall breaker. And it's really weird because, like, why, why do you do that? I mean, maybe, I mean, I've got, three children under five, so I get people to talk to me, but they don't, but I think if you have a dog, if you have a dog, I think they kind of walk past the baby to touch the dog. I think it's really like, it is, has that really all kind of magnetism to it. So I think there is a degree of agency there, which I don't think is just about having a commodified object. I think that's the animal having an influence upon society. Yeah, going back to Mira's question about cats or other pets, perhaps there's that level of interaction as well, maybe, that makes the dog's unique, I don't know. Well, I mean, I don't, I've actually never encountered one in the wild, but a shire, oh no, a horse, guide horse. Has anyone come across this, the guide horse? That if you have, you obviously know guide dogs, that you can have a guide horse. What, like a small dog? Like a small dog? Like a small dog? If you're visually impaired, yeah, like, like a... Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, so, they're like a... They're, like, they're, 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 they're a minute shed there. Yeah. Yeah, they're a miniature. They're, it's not like... It's not like, <laughs> it's like, sorry. It's like, yeah, it's like, it's a miniature. It's a miniature. It's a miniature, it's a miniature, um, it's a miniature dog. Sorry. Um, it's a miniature horse, yeah, which um, is a, an assistance, assistance animal, um, which is a horse rather than a dog. But I can see that maybe the, the genetics of a dog are, rep, are not, requisite for that role and a horse could perform that and then maybe if you had a pig or something I don't know you could but I, I don't know <laughs>